All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the sixth and final contributed talk session of Bioconductor 2020. Uh, we have four amazing talks, uh, each approximately 10 minutes in length, followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. Uh, please submit questions via the pathable poll function and make sure you, you signify in some way to whom the question is being addressed. Uh, our first speaker is Charlotte Sonneson, whose video I am about to start. Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte Sonneson and in this talk I'd like to share with you a few highlights from a recent study of ours uh, where we look at the bundles quantification specifically for RNA velocity analysis in droplet single cell RNA-seq data. But before I talk about what we did, uh, I want to say just a few words about RNA velocity in general. So it has become quite popular recently, and one reason for that, I think, is that it provides a way to extract dynamical signals, for example, differentiation trajectories from snapshot single cell RNA-seq data. So the way it does that is by assuming that the snapshot actually contains cells from different parts of the trajectory, and then it performs a joint modeling of mature mRNA, so regular gene expression, and pre-mRNA abundances to infer whether the expression level of each gene is on its way up or down, or if it's in a steady state. Combining this information across all the genes basically lets us infer where in the gene expression space each cell is headed. For interpretation, RNA velocities are often visualized overlaid on top of a low-dimensional embedding of the cells, as we see here in the figure to the right, where the dots are the cells in a low-dimensional space, and the velocity is shown in the form of streamlines indicating the main uh, direction of movement. So what did we do? Well, in order to fit this model to the pre-mRNA and mature mRNA abundances, we first need to estimate them. And we focused on this abundance estimation part. Uh, and we wanted basically to compare the existing uh, estimation method. So we approached this by considering several public droplet single cell RNA-seq dataset where there was some known dynamic signals. And to each of these datasets, we applied 12 different quantification approaches that each gave us a pre-mRNA and a mature mRNA abundance estimate for each gene. Uh, these approaches included different ways of running Alvin, Callisto bus tools, Star Solo, and Velocite. And once we had these quantifications, we applied the same RNA velocity estimation pipeline based on the SCVELO Python package to each of these abundances, and then we compared uh, the results. So uh, I will not go too deep into the results here, uh, but I will point out a couple of interesting aspects. And the first and maybe the most important takeaway, I think, is that the impact of the choice of abundance estimation method doesn't just show up as small changes in the count matrix, but it also propagates to the estimated velocities and to the biological interpretation. Here, for example, we see velocity streamlines estimated based, in, based on abundances from two different approaches, uh, overlaid on the same low dimensional representation, and the purple arrows indicate several places where these streamlines actually point in completely opposite directions between the two uh, quantification methods. And in addition, we noticed that the correlation among velocities based on different abundances was often lower than the correlation among the abundances themselves. So uh, in our preprint, we go into much more detail into these differences and explain some reasons for uh, the differences between the methods but I think this really shows that the abundance estimation is an essential part of the RNA velocity pipeline that certainly deserves uh, attention. So one thing that turns out to be quite important and which is to some extent independent of the software package that we use for abundance estimation is uh, how we deal with reads mapping to ambiguous regions. And by that, I mean regions that can be either intronic or exonic, depending on which isoform you're looking at. So I should also say here uh, that we often use the intronic read or UMI count uh, as a representation of the pre-mRNA abundance and the exonic or the full transcript uh, read or UMI count as a representation of the mature mRNA abundance. So in this gene here, for example, which has two partially overlapping isoforms, there are two ambiguous regions indicated here by rectangles and reads mapping completely in these regions 
cannot directly be unambiguously assigned as either exonic or intronic. So different methods deal with such reads in different ways. You can say that anything that's possibly exonic will be considered exonic. Or conversely, that, that if there's any evidence of a read being intronic, it will be considered intronic. Or you could put both the exonic and intronic sequences into your set of reference features and basically let them compete for the reads by quantifying them jointly. And finally, you could decide to count these reads twice, once for the exonic and once for the intronic, or not at all. And it turns out that this choice has a considerable impact on the assigned counts uh, for genes like this. And generally, we got the most reasonable results when quantifying the exons and introns jointly, um, and conversely, the worst when we double counted the ambiguous reads as both exonic and intronic. Now, of course, the question that uh, undoubtedly arises is, so which method is the best one? And I have to say that I think it's not completely trivial to answer these questions, th this question quite yet. And part of the reason for that is that we don't really have an established way of simulating realistic uh, exonic and intronic reads in a way that actually captures the characteristics of experimental data. And that means that at the moment, much of the evaluations actually have to be done on experimental data where the truth may not be fully known. And in a way, we're also extracting the expected truth from the same data. Um, and second here, we're just considering 10x data uh, and the optimal approach may very well be different for full length protocols. So I think there's definitely still room uh, for innovation and protocol specific investigations. Uh, that said, in our evaluations across the data sets that, that we used, uh, we generally got the most consistently reasonable results with, uh, with Alevin when quantifying the exons and introns jointly. However, also Callisto bus tools and Star Solo performed well for several of the data sets. And in fact, there were often larger difference between different ways of running the same tools, the same tool, for example, whether or not ambiguous reads were double counted, than between the best way of running different tools. Here, for example, we see the best uh, results of running Alevin and Star Solo uh, for this data set, and the results look pretty similar. In this plot here, for, uh, on the other hand, uh, we show the output of running Alevin in two different ways quantifying the exons and introns either jointly or independently. Uh, and here there's actually a much larger difference. So the, the right hand plot here is where we essentially double count all the ambiguous reads. So the final thing I wanted to highlight is a small tutorial that we put together for end-to-end -to -end RNA velocity quantification with Alevin uh, based on the observations from uh, our evaluation. So this workflow consists of two steps. First, we prepare the reference sequences by extracting transcripts and introns from the reference genome. So we provide an implementation of this in the ISAR bioconductor package, which is particularly handy for in the settings of this particular workflow. Uh, but there are other options as well, such as bus parse or using uh, functions from genomic, the genomic features package directly. Uh, once we have the reference uh, features, we estimate abundances with Alevin, which is a command line tool specifically developed for quantification of droplet single cell RNA-seq data which you may have already heard about in uh, Mike and Avi's workshop yesterday afternoon. We then import the Alevin quantifications into R and reformat them for use with RNA velocity software with another bioconductor package from my club called TXI Meta. Uh, and then after that, you can feed the count matrices uh, into RNA velocity software, such as SEVELO or VELOCYTE. And I also wanted to highlight here the Velociraptor R package, which is currently under development and which Aaron already mentioned in his keynote uh, earlier today. So this package provides a wrapper, uh, an R wrapper around SEVELO and directly accepts single cell experiment objects as input. So basically you don't have to leave R. Uh, and with that, I would like to round up and mention that there is a preprint available if you're interested in reading more in detail about what we did. Uh, and here is the Velociraptor GitHub repository. And thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you for a great talk to kick us off. Um, the next talk is by Davide Riso. Hello, everyone. I would, um, I'm very excited to share um, some of the results that uh, we have for our um, benchmarking of differential abundance methods for our microbiome data. And I'd uh, like to start um, uh, thanking my co-authors on this project, Matteo Calgaro and Nicola Vitulo uh, at the, uh, from the University of Verona, Chiara Mualdi 
who uh, is a colleague of mine at the University of Padova, and Levi Waldron um, at the CUNY uh, School of Public Health. And uh, especially would like to thank Matteo for all his work that has done uh, with this um, analysis. So uh, what is um, differential abundance? So we're, uh, when, you, when we're studying the microbiome, which is the collection of microbes that live in and on our bodies, um, we, one, of the, one of the main uh, um, analysis that we want to do is called differential abundance. And as the name suggests, we're essentially looking for some differences in um, the microbiome composition of two groups uh, of people, for example, healthy versus diseased. Um, this type of analysis is sort of resembling of differential, expressed, differential expression in, in RNA-seq. And in fact, many of the methods that were developed for RNA-seq are used um, uh, in microbiome um, uh, data for differential abundance. Uh, there are some challenges though, because the microbiome um, data are highly sparse and compositional. And so um, um, this is not a straightforward application of differential expression methods. And in fact, bespoke methods specifically designed for a differential abundance analysis have been proposed in the literature. Um, on top of all this, um, one of the challenges of the microbiome data is, is sparsity. So we're asking ourselves whether uh, methods that were developed for single cell RNA-seq, which is also um, uh, characterized by sparsity, could be useful in this context. And so we decided to uh, do a benchmark, and we decided to benchmark um, uh, a lot of methods, actually. Some methods that um, uh, people have been used in this type of analysis, uh, borrowing, it from, borrowing them from the um, bulk RNA-seq literature, such as the seq 2 Edgar, and Limavum. Um, we added to the benchmark um, some, some methods developed for single cell RNA-seq, such as um, using Zimbi wave weights in uh, conjunction with the uh, bulk RNA-seq methods, or using MAST, um, SERAT, and SCDE um, that were, um, there are all uh, sort of uh, methods developed for single cell RNA-seq differential expression. And then, uh, as I said, there are some bespoke metagenomics methods such as ALDEX2, MetagenomeSeq, CornCob, Songbird, and, and, and MixMC, which is part of the MixOmics uh, package. So I also am happy to report that, that most of these methods actually are implemented uh, as bioconductor packages. So um, this, this made our, our life much easier um, in, in this uh, benchmarking. So um, how did we actually um, uh, perform this, uh, this analysis? So um, first of all, um, I want to say that uh, benchmarking is, is challenging per se, um, because especially in genomics, because we, we often lack a gold standard. And so uh, we could rely on synthetic data, but that's um, not always ideal because it's hard, very hard uh, to simulate realistic data. So what we decided to do for the most part is to rely on some manually curated data sets. And in particular, uh, Levi's, uh, Levi's group has these two wonderful bioconductor packages, HMP 16S data and curated metagenomic data that um, overall comprise uh, 100 uh, curated data sets from, uh, from a variety of projects and, and, and different uh, body sites. And so this gives us a, a very diverse set of uh, data sets um, that uh, allow us to essentially benchmark uh, our methods or, or the methods that we um, looked at in, in real data. So um, of course these 10 minutes are not enough to go through uh, all that we did in this, um, in this uh, study, but uh, just, give, just to give you like a one slide overview, um, these were our objectives. So we first looked at the goodness of fit of the um, uh, underlying statistical model for each of the method. Um, we uh, looked at the ability of each method to control the type one error. And, um, and uh, we looked at um, the concordance both within each method in uh, sort of random splits of data sets to look at sort of replicability of the results for each method and also the concordance between methods to look at um, similarities between approaches. And then we looked at power through both parametric simulations, but more importantly, using um, uh, an enrichment analysis, which I will go um, in more details in a, in a couple of, um, of slides. So this is the type one error control. Um, uh, figure in our, in our paper. This is for the 16S data, and, and we have um, similar similar one for for 
shotgun meta genome sequencing. Um, here on the left side of the uh, slide, you can see um, essentially for each method, um, their ability to control uh, the type one error at three sort of uh, usual um, uh, thresholds for, for, the, for the nominal alpha. So um, here, what we did, we used mock comparisons in a 16S dataset. So we took one dataset, we randomly split in two, and we compared the two halves. And, um, and because we're, we're sort of uh, comparing uh, two halves of the same data set, we uh, assume that there are no difference, differences, and all the differences that we find are actually false discoveries. And so we record here sort of the proportion of the false discoveries, and uh, we compare it to the nominal um, value for the type one error. And, um, and the methods that sort of sit, sit below this line, this, this dashed line, are the methods that control uh, the type one error. And um, we, I should say that we repeat this 1,000 times, and that's why that this random split, so that's why we have box plots here instead of single points. And you can see that uh, we sort of um, replicate what, we, what was already uh, observed in some other um, uh, papers, which is that most methods do not control type one error. We also see that some methods are very conservative, like for example, ALDEX2 and, um, and MAST and SCDE. Um, and there are some methods for example, MetagenomeSeq, they're um, very liberal. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the majority of the methods, I should say, um, are, uh, while they do not technically control type 1 error, uh, they have an observed alpha that is only slightly higher than the nominal alpha, uh, um, suggesting that probably even though they technically do not control type 1 error, they are uh, probably going to do fine in practice. And, uh, and this include, in particular, the Seq2. And you can see that this, um, this one here, which is the one that probably most closely uh, controls um, uh, the type one error um, without being uh, conservative is, is Lima Boom, which seems to be very uh, good at, um, at, at, in this analysis. On the right side, we, we have a, a different aspect of this analysis where we look at the distance in terms of Kolmogorov Mirnov statistics uh, between the um, empirical distribution of the p-values and the uniform distribution, which is the theoretical distribution in case that there are no differences. Um, and you can see that um, some methods, um, such as um, CornCob, <coughs> LimaVu, and DSIC do very well, and they are very close to the, to the theoretical distribution, uniform distribution of the p-values. And some methods uh, do uh, quite poorly, some, such as MetagenomeSeq and ALDEX2, uh, which uh, notably they're sort of on the opposite side of the spectrum. One is very conservative, ALDEX2, and the other one is very liberal. So this just gives us half of the fit picture because it gives us, um, you know, um, the ability of not finding um, uh, false discoveries. Uh, but what about the true discoveries? And we sort of get to that uh, with uh, enrichment analysis. And that's, um, and that's um, uh, what this analysis is for. This is sort of the second uh, analysis that I want to go into the details of. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, leveraged uh, this sort of uh, comparison that we had in one of the data sets, which is supergingival versus subgingival plaque. The idea is that uh, there are some microbes um, that are aerobic and they need oxygen to, um, uh, to survive. And so they could survive in the subgingival plaque, which is exposed to oxygen, but not in the subgingival plaque. There are other microbes that are anaerobic, and uh, they thrive in the subgingival plaque in the absence of, of, uh, in the absence of ox oxygen. And so we expect to see an enrichment of um, aerobic taxa in the super, uh, overabundant in the supergingival plaque, and anaerobic taxa overabundant in the subgingival plaque. And uh, so we essentially rank each method by uh, their ability to, um, to find this sort of enrichment. And the third category that we have is the facultative anaerobic. And uh, we, um, we should see no enrichment there because as the name suggests, these microbes are able to uh, switch between aerobic and anaerobic um, uh, states. And so uh, here you see that uh, pretty much we confirm that there are some methods that are too conservative. For example, ALDEX2, SCD, and MAST, they don't find any enrichment and, and, and actually they find barely any differentially abundant taxa. And uh, there are some methods such as MetagenomeSeq that although they fi it finds the correct enrichment, 
um, it also finds many um, um, false discoveries because its uh, test is too liberal. But uh, the good news is that the large majority of the methods are actually quite good in that they detect the correct enrichment um, and uh, without finding too many false positives. And these include Adjar, Lima Boom, and Carb Corn Cob, and the Seq2. And the other good news is that um, when we look at the top uh, differentially abundant um, taxa, we see that uh, for, for most of them, the majority of the methods find them um, uh, differentially abundant, and they find it uh, consistently on the same uh, side, with the notable exception of metagenome seq that has many uh, false positives. So um, just to conclude, um, we uh, performed many more uh, analysis. I just gave you uh, a glimpse in two, in, in two of them. And, um, and here is sort of like our attempt to summarize all that we have learned. Um, we find that in general, Lima, Vum, CONCOB, and DSIG2 are the most stable methods across a variety of uh, comparisons. But of course, the perfect method does not exist. And um, uh, we need uh, to look at the data and, and do careful exploratory data analysis to sort of decide which method uh, would work best. The second uh, thing that we noticed is that count distributions uh, fit the data better than alternatives, and that um, uh, while they're appealing in, in theory, uh, both composite, we did not find um, evidence that uh, neither compositional nor multivariate methods outperformed uh, simpler methods based on uh, univariate tests. So thank you for, um, for your attention. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, dropping here the link uh, to our preprint that has many more details and also to the code. And I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Another very interesting talk. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, please post them to the Pathable poll and uh, say which speaker you're addressing your question to. Uh, the third speaker in the session is Anthony Sonro. Hello everyone, welcome for this session. My name is Andrew Sonwell. I am a PhD student in the group of Mark Robinson. And today I will present you PipeComp, which is an idea which comes from an idea of Pierre-Luc Gemma, a postdoc in our group. So I will stay in the topic of uh, bench pressing and I will present you PipeComp for the evaluation of, uh, of pipelines and analysis steps uh, applied to single cell analytic pre-processing. So single cell analytic, I guess that most of you have a rough idea of how the pipelines works. Uh, that is, uh, we have all of these analysis steps of up to the analysis steps which answer your biological question. And as most of you are here today, I guess that we are, you are interested in developing new methods. And at one point, I guess that you will find a new, a new method and you would like to implement it in a new uh, package. Typically, what you would like to, to do is then to test it and what may come in your mind would be, okay, I have my function and I would like to see how it reacts in the whole pipeline. I would like to see how it reacts uh, using different data sets with different characteristics. But then there are, there, there are a lot of challenges to, uh, to answer for the, for the evaluation. First, I would like to evaluate the different parameters and I would like to evaluate how does the combination of the different parameters answer uh, the, the, the question of how, um, how the pipeline works. And then uh, we have also a different combination of parameters to test. I would like to, to know which function yields the, the best results and if my function yields a good performance in view of the, of the whole pipeline functioning. And in the end, I will also need some evaluation metrics to get not only at the end of the pipeline, but also at other analysis steps of interest, for instance, at the, at the, at the analysis step that interests you. And I would like to aggregate these metrics in a way that I can then uh, draw my conclusions about the performance of the pipeline. So we run into the same uh, problems many times. We, each time, we very often, we do the benchmarking from, uh, from scratch. We do all of the framework from scratch. So then we had the idea of developing PipeComp for the evaluation of pipelines, that is an automatic evaluation uh, uh, package uh, to evaluate different analysis steps in any framework. So under the hood, it's built around a pipeline definition object, which is a series of uh, analysis steps with different parameters. And then you gather the, your evaluation metrics at any steps uh, that you want. You can tally specify this. 
And then this evaluation matrix, you can aggregate them as you want. By default, it will aggregate them in a, in a matrix for every combination of parameters and, uh, and metrics. So as you can see, uh, I took from uh, single server and ASIC, but you can apply it to any, uh, any field from a chip sec, as ATACSEC or ATACSEC or GWAS. So this is the structure, and then you need to, to specify which alternative functions and parameters you would like to test. And for this, you have to give typically this alternative uh, list, uh, which will then specify which function you, test, you want to test and which parameters you want to test on it, it will be then recognized by the pipeline definition and it will create all combinations of pipeline uh, that are possible and uh, simultaneously uh, test them. So that's the theory. Let's look at the practice, how it works. So as I said, um, pipe, uh, pipe comp is built around this pipeline definition, which here tells that you have two steps of analysis, each one uh, applying a certain method on, uh, on the input. And then you have the evaluation, which is done here on uh, the, the second step. And what it does is to get the number of cells, which are here, in fact, the number of columns in your single cell experiments. All you need then is uh, data sets. So here we have two little single cell experiments that you would like to test on. And the, step, the, the alternatives that you would like to test, here you can, we filter either on the mitochondrial genes or on the loadly expressed genes, and then we filter on the on the cells. So that's it. this is the alternatives that, that we want to uh, that we want to test. And then we would like to run the pipeline with the run pipeline, which will run all possible combinations of alternatives that we gave on the data sets. So here it, uh, it's finished. Then we can access the the, the results, which are typically given uh, as a matrix where you have all of the combinations, as I said, uh, for, your, uh, for your end metric. So with more data sets and more pipelines, it gets very uh, cumbersome to look at this, uh, at this evaluation metrics. So we also build evaluation, um, evaluation functions, uh, which produce heat maps, so that you can clearly aggregate all of the, the results in an easy way. So here you get the number of cells for your two functions of interest and for the different data sets. And here, for instance, you can see that one of the functions yields more cells than the, than the other one. So it was a very simple example, but the, the power of PipeComp is it's that it can be, uh, it's scalable to, um, to more data sets and to bigger pipelines. First, because it's parallelized. When, what it does is to create combinations of pipelines, and when applying for uh, applying it to each data set, uh, it runs it in a different uh, in a different thread. As you can see here, that we have this sort of uh, branching of uh, analysis steps. It's because PyCon does uh, does not uh, redo the same analysis step twice. It applies this sort of branching uh, pipelines so that it um, it's easier and uh, and faster to uh, to do. Then, if you want to uh, to analyze some uh, some uh, pre um, analysis steps, you can clearly identify which steps are giving better results because with the evaluation functions that we have, you can expand all of the steps that we, we you evaluated, or you can aggregate it. For instance, or only one step an, uh, of analysis, so that you can identify which functions and which parameters are affecting your uh, end results. Then you can customize your pipeline. You can add, modify, or delete any function, any evaluation metric, or the, the aggregation uh, in your pipeline using a single, uh, as a single function. But don't worry, you don't need to uh, do it always from scratch. For instance, we provide two huge uh, uh, pipeline templates built around single sex experiment and Serrat, uh, which do a, a lot of different analysis step uh, the, and that you can use to, uh, to adapt to your, uh, to your evaluation question. So we have here our framework, and we wanted to apply it uh, to a field where we, we, we felt we, uh, it needed it. And we looked at the number of new, pre of, uh, of new tools released in single server and ASIC, and we saw that most of them were linked to preprocessing. So we thought it would be a, a good field to, uh, to begin with, with, um, with PipeComp. So what we did was to adapt the, the, the pipeline definition 
to our needs. That is, we included all analysis steps from doublet removal, filtering up to clustering. So that is the structure. And then we, we built many wrappers from the most common tools for each one of these uh, steps. And we evaluated this, uh, this function uh, using different evaluations, mainly the, the clustering one. That is, we wanted to see how, how all of these pre-processing steps um, affect the, the clustering accuracy. That is, how, um, how do uh, they affect the, the, the ability to retrieve the same population in your data? So for instance, with normalization, combining all of the, uh, the, the parameters and function, we had tested more than a thousand pipelines that we could evaluate it. But as I said, we use this branching function that is, um, it's only virtually more than a thousand pipelines, but practically uh, Pipecom did way less uh, evaluation than uh, a than thousand pipelines. So typically that's the results that we, that we get. So we have different uh, data sets here and if the different normalization methods that are very popular in the field. And what you have here is the clustering accuracy at the true number of clusters. So that is uh, if uh, the combination of parameters yield uh, the right amount of clusters. And typically here you can see that uh, most of the methods yield a, a good uh, results. But the beauty of PyComp is that you can aggregate more than 1,000 pipelines and their evaluation into one, uh, one figure just such as, uh, as here. And typically we, you could, we could identify that uh, for some methods, for instance, uh, ACID transform uh, performed a bit better um, to allow to retrieve the, the real um, uh, subpopulation in our data sets. So we did the same also for other uh, analysis steps from filtering normalization up to uh, clustering so that we could give key recommendation of which functions and which parameter to use uh, to, to, to get um, clearer clusters in your, in your data in single cell or in a seek. And for more discussion about the pipeline, or also about the recommendations that you can see here, I invite you to look at the preprint of PipeComp, uh, which also has the, the link to the GitHub uh, repository of uh, PipeComp. With this, I would like to thank the Swiss National Foundation for the fundings and the World Robinson Lab for the help throughout the um, Pipecom development. And thanks to you for your time and attention. Wonderful, very cool stuff. Uh, so the last uh, talk in the session, and actually the last talk at BioC 2020 is by Stephanie Hicks. All right, thank you to the organizers for their heroic effort in making BioC 2020 happen. It's been amazing to be able to participate in, in this new virtual conference. I will talk about benchmarking uh, single cell imputation methods, but first I thought I would explain a little bit about the phrase benchmarking or bench pressing. So this phrase came from an article in February 2020 by Vivian Marks. The article was titled Bench Pressing with Genomics Benchmarkers. And in it, she interviewed a lot of researchers who produced some great papers where they compare and contrast the performance of different algorithms used in genomic data analysis. One of those individuals was Vieta Witt, and she gave a shout out to her fellow single cell, quote, bench pressers, in, including me. And this is because to date, I've been fortunate enough to be able to work on two benchmark papers. The first was a paper where we benchmarked methods for controlling false discoveries in computational biology. And we had a case study in there um, benchmarking single cell RNA-seq. Um, and we also have the paper that I'm going to talk about today is um, on, quote, bench pressing single cell imputation methods. So as I was preparing, um, trying to decide if I wanted to submit a talk for BioC 2020, I was talking with my friend Debbie Day on BioC Slack about whether or not attendees at this conference might be interested in such a talk. Um, I decided to go for it <laughs> and submit an abstract, uh, but I thought it would be fun to include the phrase bench pressing in actually the title of it just to make it more fun. And then I was um, happy that I was able to convince both Charlotte and Debbie Day to be able to do the same in their talk. So that's where this comes from. All right, so let's talk about uh, single cell RNA-seq data. Compared to bulk RNA-seq, single cell data has been shown to be more sparse. Um, where sparsity means the fraction of observed zeros, where the, uh, fraction of observed zeros, uh, where zero is no UMIs or reads mapping to a given gene in a cell. 
Now, historically, there are two types of zeros that people have argued about. One is a biological zero or a gene. This is a zero where a gene is not being expressed or a technical zero where you just have challenges in quantifying small amounts of mRNA, uh, such as from mRNA degradation during cell lysis or variation from just sampling lowly expressed genes. Um, this has led, to, this increased sparsity led to the development of imputation methods in a similar spirit to imputing genotype data for genotypes that are not observed. So here I'm going to show you a typical imputation scenario where we're imputing SNPs using large reference maps such as HapMap for a thousand genomes. However, I just want to make one thing clear, the difference between these imputation methods for SNPs and single cell RNA-seq is that to date, almost all of the imputation methods for single cell do not rely on an external reference map. They really depend on the data themselves. So let's talk a little bit about what is imputation doing. So let's assume we have some kind of true biological expression. And here we've got a, um, a matrix of genes along the rows and cells along the columns. And again, we've, we were able to measure the true biological gene expression. Um, next, let's put it through a single cell RNA-seq experiment. It can be any type of protocol that you're thinking of. Essentially, we're sampling mRNA from each individual cell, and we get a set of counts. It could be UMI counts, it could be read counts. And what imputation attempts to do is take this matrix that I'm going to call X and try to estimate a function F that allows us to recover the true biological expression of each cell. So the goal is to try and recover what the true biological expression is. Now to date, there are three broad approaches um, for single cell imputation method. One are model-based. So here we're directly modeling the sparsity using probabilistic models. These may or may not distinguish between biological and technical zeros. They typically impute for only technical zeros. Smoothing based, here we're adjusting usually all values, both zero and non-zero, by smoothing or diffusing the raw values of cells with similar expression profiles using, for example, something like um, neighbors in a graph. The third one are data reconstruction methods. So here we're identifying a latent space and then we're reconstructing the observed expression matrix, uh, which is no longer sparse using something like low rank matrix-based methods, which captures linear relationships, or deep learning methods that can capture non-linear relationships. Now, to date, there are around three to four studies that are benchmarking single cell imputation methods, but they really only compare um, a, a subset of the available imputation methods that are out there, like three to six. So there are actually like 18 or 20 of them um, that have been published or pre-printed. And we were interested in using some of these for our own analysis. So uh, we found it um, frustrating that there wasn't really a, a comparison comparing all of them. So we started to just explore um, the different approaches in a very simple setting. We simulated just null data or Poisson counts. And we only varied, the, the only difference is they varied by library sizes. So each cell had a different library size. So here we expect no biological difference. And then we applied imputation to the null simulated data and then applied principal components on top of the imputed data. Now each plot is one imputation method, except the plot in the middle, no imp represents, we did not impute there. Um, and we're showing you PC1 and PC2 for each one of the results. And what we found is that there was quite a bit of unexpected structure in the data after applying these imputation methods in this null setting. And this motivated us to explore these methods further. So we performed a um, quite a, a large evaluation of benchmarking 18 single cell RNA-seq imputation methods. So in the second column there, for example, we showed the different methods that we considered. We talk about the different data that we considered. Um, we use the cell bench data from Matt Ritchie's group, for example. We pre-process the data if the imputation method required it using SCRAN, log2 transforms. Um, we applied cell and gene uh, quality control metrics. We evaluated the imputation methods in two ways. One was just an evaluation of the imputed values themselves, comparing it to a bulk RNA-seq profile in a homogeneous cell population. 
And then the other settings are downstream analyses, so differential expression, clustering, and trajectory analysis. We have a variety of different metrics that we considered for performance, and then we have a set of recommendations at the end. Um, I'm going to focus on just trying to highlight one of them briefly here today, the clustering one. So the one data set we took was a set of um, 10x uh, data from PBMCs. So here there are around 60,000 cells that were purified into different cell populations. And we're showing you the UMAP representation of the data on the left with no imputation and on the right um, imputation with magic. And the cells are colored by different cell types here. And this is the true cell type. So we can apply the um, we can apply a clustering method such as Leuven-based clustering, graph-based clustering, and um, for each one of after applying each one of the imputation methods, and then we considered four different metrics for evaluation: a metric of um, accuracy, purity, adjusted rand index, and median silhouette, where silhouette is used as a measure of consistency within clusters, so how similar an observation is to its own cluster compared to others. So what we found is there, the top um, set of methods uh, that performed well here are SCBI, Saver, Saucy, and SCBI Layton is actually using the latent space that SCBI provides as opposed to using the, the reconstructed data matrix. No imputation is here highlighted in red. And then there are a set of methods that we, we labeled imputation fail. So we, our um, criteria was to let a method, imputation method run for 72 hours. And if we got no results at the end of uh, the 72 hours, we called it an imputation fail. So these were the results for um, using Leuven clustering. We also applied this using k-means clustering, and we found a consistent set of results. However, I'll just point out one aspect, um, an interesting aspect of the results. So you'll see that in the median silhouette column, which measures that um, consistency within clusters, there are some methods that really are much brighter compared to others. And so what we found was that Using the imputed values, you can calculate for each method, you can calculate the gene specific standard deviation. And, and we found that methods like MAGIC, for example, they make the um, gene specific standard deviation very small. So they shrink, the imputed values when you do clustering are, are shrunken together. And so this is potentially useful for something like clustering, but it can also be some uh, not very useful for something like differential expression. So some key takeaways, most methods, most methods can recover expression from a bulk RNA sequencing experiment in a kind of a homogeneous setting of cells. However, many single cell um, imputation methods to date um, do not improve the performance in downstream analysis compared to no imputation and should be used with caution. The performance of single cell imputation methods depends on the experimental protocol, the sparsity of the data, the number of the cells. However, if you decide to impute, there are some methods that um, outperformed other methods the most consistently, including SAVER, SCBI, cadence smoothing, and MAGIC. And I just want to give a shout out to my collaborators on this project. The, the majority of the work was done by my uh, joint postdoc, Wen Pen Hu. Um, she's amazing. And if you have any comments, feel free to reach out. There's a preprint online. All right. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Uh, so I want to thank all four of the speakers for very interesting talks. Uh, please keep submitting questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, for any of the questions that we don't get to, uh, please follow up with the speakers in Slack or, um, you know, by emailing them or messaging them on Pathable, all the platforms still available. Uh, so the first question is for Charlotte. How do you quantify exons and introns jointly? Does the reference transcriptome file contain each transcript twice, i.e., uh, first, transcripts re represented only by exons, and second, transcripts represented by exons plus introns. Yeah, so that was one of the approaches we tried, uh, and it's also included as in the in the evaluation in the comparison. So it turns out that for 
uh, 10x data, it doesn't work so well because uh, since it's like three prime um, biased, most of the reads in some of many of the genes will actually be in the last exon. So they will, it's kind of hard in that case to say whether those reads actually come from um, a splice transcript or an unsplice transcript because there are exons in both of them. So what happened was that in many cases, um, you would the, the method would wouldn't really know what to do so it would kind of split the reads half half so you would get half of the reads in the unspliced gene and the half of the reads in the spliced gene uh, so it may work better for full length protocols um, for example so instead what we did was that actually we included in the reference the transcripts and the introns in themselves so not the unspliced transcript but only the, the individual introns so I guess this isn't really a question, but uh, for Davide, the most upvoted one is, could you please post the link that you shared at the end of your presentation? Uh, so you don't need to do that. Sure, now. I'll, I'll post the uh, link to the slides as well. Yeah. And then the, the, the first actual question was, uh, why not include LEFSE, L-E-F-S-E, in the benchmark? They say this is likely the most popular microbiome differential abundance method. Yeah, um, I mean, the simple reason is that we couldn't benchmark all the methods because there are too many, many methods and, and some of them are, are quite demanding computationally. Uh, so we, we left out a couple that are very popular. The other one is ANCOM, which is the other one that um, is a popular method that we didn't benchmark. We, we sort of decided to go for the uh, newest and, 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 and most, um, I guess, user-friendly methods. Um, and, and, but, but one of the reasons we wanted to put the code out there, and hopefully we're uh, working on, on making it a, a bioconductor package, uh, is that you know, it should be in principle very easy for you to add your favorite method to our benchmark and essentially update the figure with the additional method. Uh, so Anthony, what is the input data file format for PipeCom, given it is scalable for large data sets? Uh, does it need a summarized experiment object or a count.mtx or serat object? Is it also modular for each of the steps? Um, so thanks for the question. <laughs> I, will first, I will begin with the first one. Uh, so it's scalable first for large data sets because it doesn't redo the analysis twice. That means that you don't have an explosion of virtual memory because you do over and over the, the same first steps. Uh, so then because of this branching that we have, that is we, we do relatively few, a few number of, uh, of pipelines, then it's a bit uh, more convenient for, uh, for large data sets because uh, we, don't, uh, we, also we don't keep the uh, intermediate results uh, that much. Uh, so it works better for large data sets. And the second question was... Uh, yeah, so does it need a summarized experiment object or a Surat object or? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so in fact, at the moment, it accepts a single cell experiment and Surat, and the whole, the, the whole pipeline is then uh, done on these two formats. Um, but as I said, you can totally adapt to it. So that's the power of PepComp. If you, if you, it depends on the wrappers that you are using during the, the evaluation. Uh, so Stephanie, when benchmarking, how do you select parameters that need to be tuned? Uh, do you use default parameters or do you tune the parameters? We use default parameters. That's a, a limitation of the study. Just because there were so many different methods across different evaluations, we just decided to use default. But I, I note that there are methods such as molecular cross-validation, I believe from Josh Baston, that um, can potentially improve the results if they were tuned, like especially for like the deep learning algorithms, like they could potentially result in better um, performance. Great, thank you. Uh, so Charlotte, is the agreement across quantification methods influenced by the sequencing depth? e.g. median cell UMI accounts for 10x experiments? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, which we did not explicitly look at. So um, maybe, so I mean, what, what we, we're not using all the genes in the end, so uh, we're selecting the most highly variable genes. So we select 2000 genes based on each uh, quantification. And then in, in the end, only maybe half or so of those are actually have a good enough velocity fits to actually be used for the uh, evaluation to not get an NA 
value of by Sivello. Uh, so we did note that we got a, a bit better agreement if we used exactly the same genes, so just like the, um, the ones that were selected by all the methods. So there is some of the difference that comes from them selecting different genes, but there was still quite a bit of difference still left. So there is still something that don't depend on the gene selection and that still is still there if we only consider really the most highly variable, uh, highly expressed genes. So Davide, uh, is there a reason why single cell RNA-seq methods for differential statistics were used to compute differential abundance for microbial data? Is it because of sparsity? How comparable is the sparsity between these two data types? Yeah, so, so yeah, the main reason we, we, we wanted to include those methods in the benchmark is because both metagenomics data and uh, single cell data are quite sparse. And so we thought that maybe some of the strategies that are used to uh, sort of downweight the, the influence of zeros in, in single cell um, RNA-seq differential expression um, could be useful for, uh, for differential abundance. Um, the sparsities are quite comparable. We have a figure in the in the preprint. Um, there, you know, it's it's kind of similar to what you see in 10x data. So you can go, you know, from I don't know 50 to 80 percent of zeros in in the in the metagenomic data sets that we looked at. And I guess I should say that there's a quite a, uh, there, there's there's a lot of difference in the data when you look at 16s data or when you look at um, shotgun meta metagenome sequencing data. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, you can look at the preprint for all the details, but it seems that the uh, um, single cell methods are more useful for whole metagenome than for 16S. So uh, the last question will be for Stephanie. I'm gonna jump down to the one that I want to answer. Uh, so Stephanie, do you think that the shrinkage that you saw with some imputation methods would impair trajectory analyses as transitional cells may be shrunk to one mode or the other? Yes, so we actually did benchmark trajectory or the performance of um, trajectory inference using imputed values and we saw consistent results. Um, I mean, it's, it's not you don't quite see it in terms of like median silhouette and in terms of like how dense the clusters are or how similar the imputed values are. But yes, you see the same thing. Um, so use with caution. Wonderful. Uh, so I want to thank all four speakers again for a very interesting session. Uh, up next are the closing remarks by Levi and Edine. So hope to see you all there. And thank you.